Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our audience from around the world. Thank you for joining us today. Let me introduce myself. I'm Cynthia Mark, the Global Product Marketing Lead for SIT and the Mirror, and also your moderator for our webinar today. SIT and the Mirror provides a digital ecosystem for education and research. Today, we'll be discussing how to deliver an engaging and interactive programming course in this day and age. We are thankful to have an esteemed list of speakers with us today. We have Peter Bauman from the Professor of Computer Science at Jacobs University in Bremen. We have Dipanjan Sanka, the lead data scientist at SIT Academy. We have Daniele Rakanloni from CTO at SIT Academy. Ilya Bamitov, the Chief Product Officer at SIT Alamira. Alexander Sprinov, the Senior Software Product Manager at SIT Alamira. However, before I begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded to be available for viewing post-conference. If you have any questions for the presenters, please use the chat feature and we will get back to you at the end of the session. For the webinar today, we will start with a brief introduction with each speaker before moving on to panel questions. We will close off today's webinar with Q&A from the audience. Now, let's welcome our first presenter, Peter Bauman. Over to you, Peter. Peter, I think you're on mute. As we try to figure out uh, Peter's uh, connectivity, let me move on to the next speaker first. So uh, Dipanjan Tamka, would you like to start with your introduction and uh, overview of effective techniques? Yes, uh, uh, thanks for having me here. Hi folks, hope you're doing great. Uh, I'm working as a lead data scientist right now with the uh, SIT Academy. Uh, I have industry experience of over eight years in data science, and I also love sharing my knowledge in the form of uh, teaching, uh, taking courses, webinars in the areas of data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So I just wanted to share a few effective techniques in terms of delivering uh, engaging courses, whether it's uh, in person, whether it's online or a hybrid mechanism. So one of the most important things, as you can see, which has worked for me is uh, try to sit in a quiet, well-lit room, try to make sure there is not a huge amount of echo so that you can present your thoughts and as well as your material in an easy, concise and uh, good to consume format for the audience. Another main thing is uh, don't just read whatever is the content on your slides blindly. Uh, try to share your own personal experiences. Like if I'm talking about a concept in data science, I try to share about how did I apply it in the industry or what are the tips, the tricks and the pitfalls. And the third point is probably one of the most important things. As you know, humans are visual learners. So the idea here is not to just present pages of text, but try to present things from a visual perspective. You can use whiteboarding tools. Uh, you can use some kind of visual aids so that you can make the material easy to consume for everyone out there, whoever is uh, taking the course. And the last one is considering um, if you are teaching something related to hands-on coding or even a data science or machine learning, people learn by example. It is not just about reading pages and pages of a book, right? So that is where if you can showcase hands-on examples, typically through live coding sessions, that definitely hits the spot because people then understand what, what's the point of learning this or why am I learning this as well as how can I use this? So those are typically some of the techniques which have worked for me um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, Anjan. That's interesting. It's very interesting to see how a teaching data science course can be very different from a different uh, basic programming course. Um, next, 
Uh, maybe we'll have Daniele uh, to share a bit about himself sure. and also the approach to teaching in general. Over to you. Everyone, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm Daniele, I'm the CTO at SAT Academy, which means in practice, I'm responsible, responsible for all our IT infrastructure and for supervising our portfolio of courses, of which at this point, we have a few too many to list, to be honest. And we cover a broad range of topics, some of which I am an expert on also on a technical level, like full stack development, uh, where I also teach, while other courses I only supervise and manage. Um, but that means that I had the chance to gather like both hands-on, uh, boots on the ground experience, and also more organizational and administrative perspective, which I hope gives me the sort of a full view on what it means to create a great programming course. <laughs> and at SAT Academy, our signature course format is a 12 week full-time nine to five course but it's very intense and aims at getting you from zero to being ready for a junior position in the field. So it's pretty ambitious. And um, the format is essential for maximizing the impact of course, but also the approach in teaching is crucial. And so I'm gonna try and give a more philosophical view of uh, what I think constitutes good teaching now. So thanks for switching the slide already. So I think that teaching well means telling a good story, even if the subject is technical. And so that's just what, what I try to do. Uh, and uh, the most primor primordial story one can tell, the one that humanity has told itself for millennia, is one that features a hero venturing out from civilized society into the unknown, where both treasures and monsters lurk. And after a great struggle, the hero makes sense of the chaos and returns home with the riches, whether physical or metaphorical, of his adventure. So I try to embed teaching a technical subject into the same pattern. So how does this meta narration translate into the classroom? Uh, next slide, please. So we're obviously, or the student is obviously the hero of the story. And the starting point, which is, uh, in the hero story is civilized society and everyday life. In our case consists of all the things we have already learned previously in the course. And that means that I try to summarize what has been learned as clearly as possible, stressing the scope, limitations and problems to better understand what might call us to the new adventurous journey. And I put special emphasis on the different levels of resolution uh, at, um, at which one can understand, let's say, what has been learned. Because like at the low resolution, one has to have a clear mind in seeing the big picture, architecture, and the relationship between the parts and the whole. Uh, and, you have, and then you also have to have that understanding down to, to a specific technical tools that are being used. And indeed, if you think about it in the mythological land in which our story starts, there is both a king, sort of a high level organizing principle, but then also the weapons that the friends give to the hero to start their journey, right? And now with a clear and solid base, the hero can now venture out into the night and start the adventure. And so uh, that's what the hero does. And that in, in, in practice in the classroom, it means we start a new topic, right? So we dive into this new subject, uh, contending with its challenges and struggling to make sense of it. And this takes courage on the help of, uh, of the students and careful guidance on the part of the teachers as to keep the story on track. And here maybe are some very important things that uh, are part of my approach and I'd like to focus on a second. So I think it's very, very important to just let the students struggle. You can't take the struggle away from them because it's in, in the struggle, that's where the learning hides. Uh, then you don't wanna have like, uh, no direct divine interventions or deus ex machinas to keep this uh, narration story going because they're unsatisfying in movies, for example, and they don't work in class because students just take things as, as a given and it prevents understanding. No speed running to the objective. One has to learn how to do the important things manually before starting to use pre-made tools. In practice, this, for example, means that instead of starting with a fancy coding framework, you first have to do it have to learn doing it manually before using the pre-made tool that just gives you the solution right away. Because if you just start with a pre-made framework and you run into trouble, you have no idea how to actually fix it because you have no idea what's actually going on behind the scenes. And finally, maybe the, the most important quality I believe a teacher should have, I sort of mentioned it already, is they should have the capability to switch between a macro and a micro view, like all the time. Because this is what I believe enables them to contextualize every little thing they teach. And in my experience, after seeing many, many teachers teach many different subjects, that's really what makes the difference for the understanding of students. Okay, so back to our little uh, mythological analogy. So now, you know, we have conquered the monster monsters and uh, we can return home with the treasure that we have found in the known and we, and can use it in practice and everyday life and stressing how the newly learned topics fit into what we have learned before. So I think that uh, the bootcamp environment is ideally suited to deliver the story with maximum effect because being full-time and relatively short, it is by definition a challenging adventure. 
And the social nature of the bootcamp helps in not only teaching the technical skill, but also helps to shape the character and method, which I think is also very important. And in all of this, the teacher, at least for, for us, for us at the Academy, the TA, the teaching assistant plays a really crucial role in this experience because they're like the divine messenger or village sage, or you know, the fairy that appears out of nowhere to help the hero and guide them on onto the path. But there again, it's important that it's, it, they give advice sort of, and they push the story forward, but they shouldn't take away the adventure, right? Because it's still on the student to sort of go out there and, and do it. Finally, maybe a note regarding having a hybrid bootcamp. Um, I think that for us, the experience of having a uh, hybrid format has worked pretty well. Uh, we have been able, I think, to deliver most of the value that we're used to delivering in class. Uh, I think that the main challenge lies in keeping individuals motivated because, you know, as I, out, as I tried to lay out, right, it's an adventure and it takes courage and it takes education and it needs motivation. And maybe the hardest thing of the hybrid, at least for us, the hybrid format is to keep um, the story going for the student and to keep the, the, the student motivated. But since we have uh, our boot camps, um, the teaching assistants and program manager are very, very involved. So they still talk to the students a lot every day, you know, a constant interaction. And so we become aware of these problems fairly fast and can move to fix them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Daniele. I think now I want to attend your class. Come on, you're talking about kings and university <laughs> of course. A boring a technical well. topic would be really exciting. Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I see Peter is back. Peter, would you like to unmute yourself and see um, if your mic and video works this time? Yes. And here Excellent, I am. Peter. I apologize. No. I'm just lost in too many windows here. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Uh, my camera is still asleep, but I am still eager uh, to share some thoughts with you. Uh, my name is Peter Baumann. I'm at Jacobs University teaching uh, practical computer science, web service databases, and software engineering. Incidentally, actually, I'm from industry and have experience with large and small companies, also founding my own one. And so my goal is to get students as close as possible to industrial situations in that part of their education. Uh, just by way of setup, we have, uh, wait a moment, uh, we have a databases and web services course that was last fall, and here people as a project actually established some core of a web service, so they get familiar with the web stack. Here in software engineering, we utilize that in spring, so that they also establish a different project, but as a web service with a database underneath and some web front end. And so we do not use some traditional C++ or so, but JavaScript and uh, Python and SQL. Okay, the different twist here is that they have to do group work where they could before in the database course choose their own setup, but now actually they are thrown together randomized. That means on the one hand, every two weeks they work in teams and they get randomized together so they get a new colleague and second they get a new code base to work on reflecting the situation in industry that you never start a project from scratch but you always have something to build upon okay that is actually uh, quite uh, common and that helps them to think in terms of not programming but programming in the large programming in teams Okay, uh, that works actually quite nice in the Corona set. Well, what means nice? It works in a Corona setup in that respect that we are used to working asynchronously. Students go home, they meet virtually possibly today, and they work on this. And then they deliver results by committing that to a repository. Uh, there is actually uh, weekly slots for support and for tutorials. So yes, there is touching base, of course, and there are mailing list communication, etc. But students actually this way learn how to work remotely. And it's still important to have the counterpart these sessions so that they get in sync because, well, we all know discipline is something that can become too abstract sometimes. So we really need to touch base again. So that is the setup where we try to get them close. And now, well, teaching programming. Actually, what we do is programming in the large, programming in teams, not the basics of statements and functions. 
The one thing that every programmer knows, there is a royal road. You need to chase bugs to learn that, and you need to get through it. Therefore, we do the practical work. You also need to learn about practical consequences of your design that you have done, whether something works or not. So walking down the avenue, setting up a design, and implement it. So it needs practice. And that can mean that you invest evenings and nights. Unfortunately, this is the reality of programming. How you do that, essentially, I believe is secondary. So online, well, this is what we have to do right now. Uh, doing that face to face was the good old style. I guess we are away from that. So hybrid maybe is the future, but that doesn't work just by uh, pressing a button. But that is something that students need to practice. And by the way, we as teachers as well, we need to devise methods for doing that. In the end, industry today is hybrid anyway. So this is a good preparation. And so in some sense, uh, we are at the forefront of virtualization, if you mean anyway. So uh, that is what we have to live up with. And that is uh, what students, I believe, need to learn beyond just writing line after line of code. So these are my thoughts uh, for this respect. In this respect, I'll be happy to answer questions. But for now, thank you for bearing with me and giving back to Cynthia. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. I'm so glad we managed to get through the technical hiccups just now because it's really good to hear from you, to hear from Daniela and to hear the Panjan. So let's move a bit on. And now, can we have Alexander Sminov to share a bit of his thoughts? on coding labs in general. Yeah. Alex? Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm Senior Product Manager in SIT Alimira and I'm responsible for uh, SIT Alimira Coding Lab. So uh, today I want to uh, give some insights on how we approach the uh, creation of the platform for uh, interactive coding courses and uh, like how, how we do it. So basically the, the main goal for us is to create the like best UX for the both instructors and students. So uh, like, so the platform will suit all the needs. So uh, if we speak about the instructor's approach, uh, we're trying to build the code centric, uh, developer friendly uh, course authoring tool, which will allow to create uh, both theoretical and practical content in one place and also uh, for the instructor to be able to integrate the coding lab with the LMS system to track the student's activity, to do the manual assessment, to grade the uh, student codes and so on. So basically we're trying to develop the platform which will uh, see the needs of uh, uh, inst institutions, uh, schools and boot camps for the programming courses. Um, as for the students, uh, we are also trying to build the live coding environment where the students will be able to cooperate and work on the uh, tasks together. So this may be like the uh, teamwork uh, as a, like a big project or a collaboration in order to help uh, uh, each other on the difficult exercises. So we're also working on that. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, when the instructor is creating the coding lab, uh, he creates some practical content, which uh, is also provided with the automated assessment by the, the after tests, tests, which are created by the instructor, or which can be automatically generated uh, inside the platform. Uh, and then the, the platform can be integrated with the any third party LMS systems in order to run courses in groups or uh, also to track the students' uh, progress and activity uh, in order to uh, create some uh, like more adaptive courses. For example, when the instructors see that uh, um, some exercises are too easy for, for his group of students, he may adjust the difficulty of the course and uh, to give some more difficult exercises for some of the students. Um, and also to assist the students when it's needed. So when the students are struggling, they can request help from the instructor and instructor will be able to, to help the students. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and also uh, one more important thing is that uh, programming and the coding in general is not only for the like, uh, for schools and uh, for the universities, but uh, there is a great uh, uh, 
great impact on the programming from the like uh, elder people uh, who are also trying to starting to learn the coding. That's why we're also focused on the uh, support of the full stack programming courses and front end uh, development courses. So the boot camps who, are, who have these courses will be able to to use our platform. Um, so yeah, but basically the like the main difference is that uh, these courses are uh, more difficult in general than the like uh, classic uh, computer programming courses, but uh, we're trying to to work with them also. Um, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you, Alex. It's interesting, right? How technology has evolved these days that, you know, there's so many tools that help us to do what we need to do day to day, from teaching to learning, et cetera. Our last speaker, before we move on to our panel questions, will be Ilya Baimitov. He will share with us um, Aseti Elamira's vision and how technology can support delivering an engaging and effective course. So yeah, over to you. Um, hi everyone, I don't really have slides, but uh, what I can share with you about the, the vision of the future is, is that, uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, the learning is a social activity. So uh, as Alexander said, uh, we will be providing uh, certain uh, tools and certain technology for students to work together on projects. Uh, and I think Peter told you about the same, that uh, students uh, learn and work best in groups. So we will have a product called Practicum, which is um, mainly about organizing project-based uh, learning for uh, small groups of students. Uh, second thing, second point is that um, uh, because learning, especially coding, is uh, mainly achieved by doing. Uh, we will uh, try to provide the most effective environment event environment for actually doing the, the programming, right? So, as you can see, we we have uh, we have integrated, um, uh, you know, Python notebooks and IDEs in in Alamira. We will continue to to make the uh, this uh, coding environment better and, and more productive for students. And finally. Uh, I think the big theme in um, uh, in educational technologies learning is uh, adaptivity and intelligence, and uh, the sort of the ultimate goal is to uh, to have somebody to to have a, an illusion right of of a tutor uh, or to have a virtual tutor that is always with you and. Uh, by um, having an intelligent dialogue with the student can uh, guide the student better towards, uh, you know, better solutions, more effective code, uh, uh, you know, learning faster, uh, learning deeper, and so on. So imagine uh, the way we see it is, uh, uh, if you guys are familiar with uh, intelligent co code review systems or automated code review systems, right? They, they're capable of analyzing uh, correctness of the code, uh, style of the code, uh, you know, certain aspects of the code, like security and, and scalability and whatnot. So imagine just the same, uh, or sim I would say not the same, similar uh, functionality of the intelligent uh, tutor, intelligent agent that is watching the student uh, writing code. Uh, but providing feedback not in terms of reviewing, not in, not like in, in, in a very imperative form, but in terms of in a form of a leading questions or a Socratic dialogue or something like that. So that's the that's the vision for the intelligent uh, tutor. Uh, Thank you, Ilya, for sharing that. It will be really interesting to see, you know, once Alamira launch all these tools that can elevate teaching that we have today. So. Now, let's move on to another section, which is, I think, really interesting, where we will be featuring a sort of a list of panel questions uh, for the different speakers to share their views. Um, the first question is, do you think the future of teaching a programming or coding class is hybrid? Peter, I know you shared a touch on a little bit of this earlier, uh, but could you expand a bit more? On what you yes, think. indeed, indeed. And uh, my personal opinion is yes, 
Definitely, because industry is working like that anyway today. Think about uh, the scene where you sit together with a few colleagues from next door. You go into a meeting room, sit together, and then you pull in other people from other uh, countries, continents, and you have to solve a problem together. And you work asynchronously, and then you sit together and meet. So all of that uh, will be mixed in the future. There will be not only online, not only face-to-face, -face, but the mix is already there in practice. Thank you. Daniele, what do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, I have to agree because the, the advantages just outweigh the disadvantages. As I said before, I think the, dis the disadvantage tends to be how engaged people are and there's some other, I think, um, challenges in... Uh, the, the communication is a bit less constant, right? If it's hybrid, I think. Uh, I mean, unless you have a great tool, maybe like Alamira that helps to smooth that out. Um, but in the end, I mean, people just want to have the option to to attend courses uh, and even work right now remotely. And so having things in a hybrid format is just, uh, yeah, it, it's just go is going to be the future. Thank you. Dipanjan, do you feel the same for data science course too? Yeah, I think, uh... I think no matter what the course is, um, the reachability of it increases as you make it hybrid because people don't need to worry about like showing up every day at a certain time of the day to do the course. Uh, they can just join online. And I think as Peter correctly mentioned, the async part is really good because that's how people are working in the industry where you are just joining in whatever a Zoom room or something like that and from different continents brainstorming on a problem. Same thing with regard to courses, it becomes really important that uh, people don't need to waste a lot of time commuting, so they save that time. Plus a lot of courses nowadays are being taken up by working professionals. And after work, they will typically, let's say, join in on the course, like let's say a part-time program, and they will literally not have the energy to travel again somewhere and then do the course. So in that way, I tr truly think that the future of, um, Education in that way is hybrid in the way that it will enable a lot of people to upskill rapidly and uh, we'll be able to get rid of some of these other roadblocks, which can happen, especially if you think about in person, not that in person is bad, like Daniel rightly mentioned, you have more engagement, more interaction, but in th these ways, we definitely have some advantages of the hybrid uh, medium. Thank you, all three of you. It's tough being an adult these days, isn't it? You're expected to work, to look at your family, and you're expected to study. It's like non-stop 24-7. But this is the new normal that we're living in, isn't it? Okay, let's move on to the next question. How do you adapt your teaching approach to suit the various learning needs within a class? Dipanjan, why don't I start with you today for this question? Yeah, so... Uh, there are a few things I look at uh, when I think about what my teaching approach should be. One is, uh, who is my audience? What is their skill and competency level? Because ultimately, I believe that uh, if you're teaching something, you should try to make it as simple as possible. There is no point in making things way too complicated or using like complex words or jargon unnecessarily because people just start switching off. So if I see that uh, the competency of uh, the people attending a certain session is pretty advanced, I will not waste time on, let's say, talking about foundations or simple things which they already know about. I'll dive right into, let's say, the more complex stuff. Otherwise, if I see that people are more of on a beginner level or they are still learning some of the concepts, I will uh, adapt myself in such a way that I start off with the simpler foundational concepts and then I build on it. The other thing in terms of my approach is I typically try to always teach by example. So if I'm teaching a concept, I will always uh, talk about how can you use this Practically, uh, I think as we discussed that the practical thing is always very important because especially with uh, courses which focus on uh, making you job ready or industry ready, it's not as compared to, let's say, something which is purely academic in nature. And that is where uh, I truly believe that um, you have to adapt your teaching approach in terms of your audience. You have to focus on uh, practical aspects, maybe show some examples 
draw some things using a whiteboard to kind of draw flow diagrams, so how, show how things work, and not just rely on, let's say, a couple of slides or just some text which you just read mechanically, because that is how your audience connects to you. And you can even talk to them about how you maybe applied that concept uh, when you are working or when you're doing a project and so on. Thank you for sharing that, Dipanjan. How about you, Peter? Is it the same for software engineering courses? Yes, definitely. I would underline that. And by the way, uh, isn't it frustrating for a computer science guy like me that he doesn't get the camera to work this morning? As usual, it worked yesterday. So sorry for that. Uh, well, uh, for teaching with programming, I believe actually uh, it opens up more degrees of freedom, uh, but as, ha as has been pointed out, it also needs some adjustments from the teacher to have a variety of means that are appropriate, of course, and that's an important aspect. It also needs more discipline from the uh, students. Normally, the students go into a course, they listen to it, and then they have to work at home, which they do or they don't do. Here, there is more emphasis on own work, and that requires more discipline. So I believe that is something uh, that is important to see as well. It's a teamwork between teacher and student. And technical means, fortunately, are there. Uh, you can give them feedback early, like they can do their own code review with tool support, for example. So I guess Alimira will provide uh, valuable tools here and that is something that can help but still i would like to emphasize hybrid we need human connection here uh, we cannot only let them go thank you peter okay let's move and change a bit of perspective now in uh, sort of uh, oh sorry still back to the same question on how do you adapt your teaching approach to suit the various learning needs within a class um, but I wanted to get the perspective from the product development side of it. So Alex or earlier, what are your views from the product development standpoint? Is there anything uh, technologically that could be used to adapt uh, a teaching approach? Uh, yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Oh, sorry, Elia, uh, I will just start. Okay. Um, actually, I wanted to mention that uh, we see from the from the like uh, companies with whom we're uh, communicating about the platform, we see that uh, there is like um, uh, an approach which includes both uh, uh, teaching assistants and also the automated grading system. So, in my opinion, the the best combination is to have both of them when the like part of the manual job uh, can be uh, taken from the uh, teaching assistant to the like automated systems. Uh, but in some cases, the, the automated assessment is also needed uh, in order to check the, the solution, to check the student's code and to help uh, if it's needed. So in my opinion, the, the hybrid approach uh, is the best option here. Elia, do you have anything to add on adaptive um, learning? Yes, I think uh, I think that uh, ultimately the, these things don't really uh, they're actually not different. Uh, so basically, you have the same sort of intelligent agent assessing the code of of the you know written by the student, and you can use it both for grading or when it's uh, you know it's called a summative assessment, right? When you just need to assess the quality of the work. Or you can use it uh, use it in the form. Uh, it's called a formative assessment when uh, basically you can assess and uh, and guide and, and teach at the same time. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's it's uh, sort of the same technology. And uh, yes, you can you can use it uh, you can use it very productively for both grading and, and for teaching. Thank you for that. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, and it's really not this one. I think it was, uh, you skipped the question, uh, the previous question. How involved and important is a teaching assistant in a student's learning journey? Correct, thank you for that. Um, Daniele, I think just now in the introduction, you touched a bit about teaching assistant. Could you elaborate a bit more? How does that work in practice? I mean, for, for us at SAT Academy, it's uh, the teaching assistant is very important. 
as I, I like to say that when the students think of the course, they think of the teaching assistant. And when they think of the teaching assistant, they think of the course, because it's really sort of the teaching assistant with time becomes the face of the program in a sense, right? It's the, the, the reference point for the students, uh, especially on a like really uh, technical and uh, domain knowledge level. Then there's also a program manager that also sort of becomes the face of the program more on an administrative and emotional perspective, let's say. But so the, the TA is really a central figure in, in our courses at least. And I think um, it, it, it's just super important for the learning experience. It also goes a bit to the other, to the previous question of how you tailor the, the, the learning experience to the needs of various students, right? And if you have a human in there, uh, it sort of happens automatically and dynamically in a sense because if there's constant inter interaction and teaching assistant and the, and the students are sitting in the same room physically maybe even or in case of a hybrid boot camp right it's still some somehow set up where you have rooms and students can just drop in so it's still very dynamic and it feels still pretty live then the TA always knows uh, how to adapt sort of their explanations to the students because the TA knows the, stu the students it knows their levels their problems and so on and so forth so it's really very important. Thank you, Nanelli. Peter, how about you? Uh, in a university perspective, uh, is teaching assistant something that, you know, it's really crucial? Absolutely. They are essential from several respects. First of all, uh, if you have a course of uh, something between 60 and 100 students, you cannot do all of that alone. In such an agile approach with two weeks increments, you have to go through all the projects all, every two weeks. So you need helping hands. Of course, these helping hands, yes, they are students that have been picked because they can use computer science and IT tools already. But on the other hand, you need to make sure that the grading is balanced, uh, the assessment they do, and therefore uh, tools are very helpful. And uh, they also get uh, rules from my side, written rules uh, that they uh, have to follow so that we ensure uh, balanced assessment. That's one thing. But here's a social aspect. Actually, some students, I mean, our students come from all over the world. Some come from cultures where it's not normal, let me put it this way, to approach a superior. You are mm -hmm. told all over your life to shut up. And so it's difficult for them to go over that and approach me sometimes. The TAs are the missing link here because actually this is from student to student so they can exchange and talk about that. And my students do not necessarily disclose, this guy has told me something in confidence, of course not. But they can ring a bell with me, hey, there is something in course that people didn't understand, for example. So this is a very important communication channel for me on a social level. And finally, uh, those uh, TAs, they have the important role of getting into, uh, uh, into, the con uh, into contact and giving support. We do that twofold. Number one, via mailing lists where students are available, okay, except for late at night or exactly that. I don't know. They have different timings. Anyway, and then face to face. Now walk in we cannot do right now. And therefore it's also virtual. It's a fixed slot where they can come with camera on so that they really get a direct exchange and they can uh, talk in a team, in a group. Thank you, Peter. Vipanjan, anything else to add from uh, beyond what uh, Daniele and Peter have shared here? No, I think they, they uh, talked about it perfectly. Like um, TAs are typically the missing link between um, the teacher and uh, the students. And at least for us in the SIT Academy, it's an integral part because they take care of a lot of aspects, uh, motivating the students when they feel down, helping them when they are stuck, helping them clear the roadblocks in their course, um, making lives for us, uh, making our lives easier, basically. Mm -hmm. So definitely, definitely they are super useful, super useful. Great. Shifting it to you, Elia, how do you think uh, SIT Alimera's teaching assistant in the future will be able to support the uh, challenges that all our instructors and professors are clearly facing day to day? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, I agree with the, the previous uh, speakers that teaching assistant is an essential element in, in the entire teaching system. Uh, I think the other sort of side of this medal, the other side of this coin is that teaching assistants are usually uh, not very well paid. They're kind of overworked. Uh, and uh, basically we have 
Uh, I mean, that may be different for coding boot camps, but for the universities, it's definitely the case. Usually students try to try to moonlight as, as teaching assistants, right? And uh, essentially what, we, what uh, the, the Elamir's vision is that we want to automate the routine the routine part of teaching assistants work, right? So we don't want to replace the, the sort of the human element of a teaching assistant, whereas the kind of a more experienced uh, person uh, shares their, you know, shares their experiences with, with, uh, with students and, uh, you know, personal conversations and kind of mentoring part. But the, the more routine part is, uh, you know, answering technical questions, um, helping with solving problems, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, uh, checking and, and grading homework. I think that could be replaced with uh, with what we call ATS, intelligent tutoring system, and I think it can uh, simultaneously uh, reduce the the demand for you know reduce the number of teaching assistants uh, assistants required uh, for the kind of for, the, for organizing the whole process and at the same time increasing the quality of interactions between students and teaching assistants and the human assistants. Well, I definitely look forward to the day where we can pilot it and see how we can put that in practice in supporting an instructor or professor's day-to-day uh, -day teaching. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, can technology replace teaching? I think, Daniele, with the title of Chief Technologist Officer, you can't run away from this uh, question. It's a very contentious question, I would think. Yeah. Some people are fearful. Some yes. are embracing <laughs> it. So what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I think it is a pretty complicated question. If I was forced to give a, an, a clear answer, let's say, is mm -hmm. I think it could in a perfect world. Uh, but I think, as I mentioned before, the main challenge is actually the students themselves in the sense that you need to keep on motivating them. You, you need to stay on track. And there, the human element is just super important, right? Because whether it's a TA, whether it's the teacher, the program manager, have just having a human there, it sort of creates a, a sense of I don't know, maybe responsibility in the students so that they have to, a bit of peer pressure also, if you want, right? You don't want to disappoint the person you, you started to build a relationship with and you know, you, you've sort of communicated that you wanted to embark on this journey and you don't want to disappoint not only yourself, but sort of also the other human there. And in a fully digital, right? Purely digital ex and, and, uh, experience, but somehow miss, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit missing. So. Uh, I think that's the hindrance to going a hundred to yeah a hundred percent replacing uh, teaching with technology. But I think, as Ilya said, maybe that shouldn't be the completely the goal. Anyways, the goal maybe should be to create tools that just automate everything that you know can be automated and and make the, the few humans that are involved so much more effective and sort of create right the augmented teaching assistant, the super powerful teaching assistant that sort of uh, is just uh, yeah. Provides a great Thank experience. you for that. <laughs> Thank you for that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, actually. No, no. <laughs> Peter, I know you are hating off, but I think this is very interesting to hear your perspective. Do you think technology can replace teaching? Uh, the answer is a very clear no. Students are humans, <laughs> and for their education and for their communication, they also need humans. Okay, now. Um, IT people and computer science people are rather special, so they can live for a long time without human contacts, but uh, at some time uh, they just need to touch base again. In our domain, in IT world, we are used to having tool support to make our tasks less error prone and to more efficient, and that is certainly something that is of great help to students as well, but it cannot be the only thing. Thank you. Uh, Dipanja, do you concur with uh, the feedback from both Daniela and Peter here? Yeah, I mean, if you have uh, like simplified courses, which is about, let's say, uh, picking up a programming skill or something, you can always have uh, completely automated courses. But uh, the lack of the human um, touch, uh, I think, as uh, Peter mentioned, that is uh, super important because uh, typically, when uh, students take a course, they are not just looking to go through the content on their own, but they are looking to learn through some experiences. And I think that is where, I mean, I mean, we see a lot of things happening in the world of AI where they're trying to automate things, they're trying to build bots and assistants. But uh, some of the things which are still super hard is uh, understanding context 
as well as uh, sharing experiences. I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to automate something, you have to dump a lot of data into it to program it, to learn from it right at the end of the day. And that is where I think humans are still, um, you can say superior in a way that they have this thing called the brain, which has been inculcating so many experiences on a day-to-day basis. And that is what they use at the end of the day to share not just the content, but uh, the most effective way to understand the content as well as use it for the future. So in that perspective, I think um, it's at least for a long time, I don't see that happening. I don't know what will happen, let's say 20, 30 years down the line, but definitely uh, humans are super important in terms of uh, providing the right kind of experience, not just uh, people learning the content mechanically. So, yeah. Thank you, Dipanja. And I guess we are humans are social creatures, aren't we? We always need the element of touch, no matter where technology is. Technology probably will elevate our teaching, uh, ultimate things, but at the end of the day, that human touch is really critical. Okay, let's move on to the final panel question here. Um, from the teaching and learning perspective, how do you see the future of coding? Does anyone want to take that question first? before I start calling your name out? Shall we start with you, Dipanjan? Because you finished earlier. Uh, sure, so in terms of the future of coding, uh, I feel like uh, often you will, um, like so far, we haven't had super great tools which can, I mean, as we just discussed, right? You can automate grading or you can, um, provide some self-checks as people are trying to learn coding. We, we are having platforms which keep coming up, but I think now with uh, technological advancements, we can get to that level where uh, the future of coding can be such a way that you can call it like a hybrid system where uh, we can have the teacher teaching the concepts, giving some insights in terms of how to use these concepts or how to apply them based on some examples. And you have uh, these platforms, right, right, which can be leveraged to um, provide you an experience where you can sit and uh, do hands-on coding and then get the feedback live on the fly, right? And I think we, we saw some examples with uh, Almira, and I think that is exactly what I see happening, where you are getting a suite of tools which can help you enhance your experience by getting instant feedback instead of, let's say, solving an assignment right, solving a coding or a programming assignment, turning it in and maybe waiting for a week and then getting back the feedback. Here it's instant, it's live, and it helps you move on to the next, um, the next thing which you're learning. And uh, you save a lot of time and um, the instant feedback definitely helps you keep improving. So I think in that way, these tools are definitely going to enhance mm-hmm. our coding, like the learning experience uh, over the next several years. Thank you, Dipanjan. How about you, Daniel? Daniel, do you think we will yeah. have another mystical creature that can help yeah. us? Yeah, to, uh, that would, would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where, where I see the whole thing going, I mean, I think what's ha- what has happened and is always happening is sort of, first of all, the the um, there's an evolutionary process in a sense where the best resources get selected, right, to learn stuff. You see that online, I think, very clearly. We're increasing, you know, you have a, just a... Uh, an offering that is getting better and better globally in terms of um, what yeah, that you can choose from from where to learn. And on the other hand, the thing, the technologies that we already have become easier and easier to use, right? More high level, more and more high level. And what I think that means is that at least for the areas that already exist, right? I mean, so of course this doesn't apply to maybe like very new and uh, exciting things that are going to pop up, but for, for the areas that already exist. Uh, I think there's going to be less and less footwork to do uh, in terms of coding, for example. And so the focus is going to shift more and more onto like architecture and really understanding the concepts and sort of it's it's a bit, yeah, the focus is just going to shift a bit from uh, putting a lot of work in just coding and coding, and that's going to be taken care of more and more automatically. And so, yeah, the focus is going to be more on the on just understanding the, the concepts and the relations between things. Okay, thank you for that, Daniel. Um, Ilya, what are your thoughts on this? What's the future of coding? 
Well, I think the future of coding is, um, like I said, uh, it, you know, the human part, right? The, what humans are best at is uh, what we call synthesis. So, which means that uh, we take our knowledge, we combine it into some sort of new ideas, right? Creativity. And what computers are best at are is analysis or intelligent agents or computers, whatever, right? So, uh, combination of that, uh, you know, when you're basically working on your own, uh, I think the best uh, system would uh, try to help you achieve your goals, right? Whether it's write certain, you know, codes, a certain algorithm or a certain component. And it almost doesn't matter if it's a learning process or actually uh, you're doing it at work. I think the kind of same principles and same even same uh, technology can apply. And again, uh, learning whether it's learning or whether it's work uh, to support the human creativity, we need to provide tools that support uh, you know in very engaging style of collaboration. So uh, that that's something we're also working on, right? And. Uh, what's unique maybe for uh, learning and teaching is the ability to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to ask your sort of mentors for, for help, right? Which is the human part of, you know, teaching and learning. And um, that's, that's basically it, right? So again, intelligent tutors that help you uh, do your individual work and tools that support uh, creative collaboration between uh, people uh, to help uh, achieve the kind of overall group group goal. Great, thank you for sharing your insights earlier. Alex, I remember you mentioned before when you were a student, you were learning computer science yourself, right? So yeah. if you were to imagine your shoes as a student now, how would you like to see the world of coding as a student? Yeah, uh, I would like to see it more automated <laughs> than it was before. <laughs> and uh, yeah, actually, I see that the like whole world is going in this direction. And also, we are trying to, to go in this direction. So actually, I agree with the previous speakers. And uh, I also think that um, in the future, in the nearest future, we'll be able to automate as many things as possible in terms of the computer science and coding. But the things which... Uh, uh, which are hard to automate, and uh, I'm not sure that it will be possible in the nearest future, is to automate the communication between the uh, students and between students and instructors. So this communication and assistance and collaboration uh, will be still in place. But uh, I think that uh, like the, the, the simplest uh, coding course, for example, will be uh, almost fully automated. So for example, uh, when you just uh, have a, like a, you know, for example, a school course on the Python programming, and you just can create a, like a basic uh, course from the prepared blocks, for example, and uh, also to assign students to it. And I think uh, most of the like uh, parts of the content creation in this way uh, will be automated, and the instructors will need to just uh, assist the uh, students and to to help them during the courses. Yeah. I think that's, that's our future. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for that, Alex. And actually, thank you to all our speakers today for all your candid response. Uh, I know that the question about whether technology can replace teaching is pretty contentious. I think it's a question that everybody has in mind. Sometimes they don't dare to touch on it. But thank you for all your candid response. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So we will not be able to open for a live Q&A session. However, what we will do is we'll definitely take note of all the questions here. And thereafter, we'll respond or I'll get our speakers to respond to all these questions and we will send the responses back to you via email. So again, thank you everyone for your time today. And please, I would really appreciate it if um, uh, all you attendees, all of you attending the course today, to spend a few minutes to give us some feedback uh, on before we plan our next session. Thank you everyone for your time. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, folks.